get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs like the founders of RX Bar, Quest Nutrition, P90X, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today's episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co found with my business partner, John Corcoran. Rise25 creates 100% outsourced VIP special events for software companies or conference organizers. Uh, We do them all over the country and we help the company bring their highest level customers together to connect and collaborate. You can learn more, find out if your community qualifies at rise25.com and there may or may not be a video on that page where John and I show up dressed as Elvis. Uh, Today's episode is also brought to you by Brand Driver. Brand Driver helps e-commerce brands grow online sales and help you to protect your brand. I did a demo and loved how the dashboard creates a visibility so you can see all your reviews and questions that you may have scattered across Amazon that you need to answer, but they're on one screen. So go to branddriver.com to find out more and you can ask for a tour also. Today, I'm very excited. We have Maddie Haslack, who is the founder of Love Grown that started in 2009. It's hard to believe probably it's uh, almost 10 years old. Love Grown has a mission to make cereals healthier, and their tagline is beans for breakfast. And just let me explain before you're like, what are you talking about? Their cereals are made with a blend of navy, lentil, and garbanzo beans with good flavors, such as chocolate and strawberry power O's. In addition to cereals for kids and adults, they also have ancient grain granola and regular granola. They can be found in thousands of stores across the U.S., such as Sprouts, Kroger, Whole Foods, Safeway, Natural Grocer, and many more. Maddie, thanks for joining me. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, I'm excited. And um, it all started with your mom's recipe. So I want you to tell me your first attempt, your first product you attempted to create. Well, so this is an amazing story because we, my husband and I met while we were undergraduates at the University of Denver. Alex knew he always wanted to start his own business and he was like, we should take your passion for cooking and healthy food and we should package products and sell them. And I was like, you're crazy. My background, I was majoring in sociology, my background's in nutrition, but going into natural foods really was not in my pipeline or what I saw, but Alex was like, we should take your cooking and we should sell it. And we originally wanted to make and sell fresh pesto, quickly pesto. realized perishable Why pesto? products, yeah, pesto. but quickly realized perishable products are so challenging. And we were in it, I mean, sharing a kitchen and a door, you know, in like a house with college friends. And um, so we didn't have, we had limited fridge space. So pesto didn't really make the cut. And instead, we took my mom's granola recipe, which she had made my entire life growing up. And Alex loved it. And he said, we should take this and we should sell it. So we started bringing different versions to our classmates, friends, and professors. And fast forward, we graduated a year early from the University of Denver in 2008. We moved up to my hometown in the mountains. And we were working full-time jobs. And we got our first bags of granola into local coffee shops and then got it into our local city market. And from there, City Market is a subsidiary of Kroger. We went from one store to 1,300 stores in a year and a half. Wow. What are some of the growing pains with that, the good and the bad? I think there's a lot of growing pains that we really had to overcome. First and foremost, we went from baking in a commercial kitchen in a small town to then having to get a larger commercial commercial kitchen when we came to Denver and just figuring out how to grow. We all, we manufactured ourselves for the first four years of Love Grown. And so we had to learn supply chain and operations and just the logistics of it. And I think neither of us, we were fresh out of college. So this was our first job. And I think that there were so many different things that we learned and heartaches that we went through during that time. 
But then we also had to figure out the production side and the ovens and just the equipment because it's so different than anything you're baking in your, your kitchen at home. So those were two of the biggest things. But then you're also dealing with distributors and retailers. And there's just so many nuances in this industry that as consumers, we take for granted. You buy something in the grocery store yeah. and you take it and eat it but being on the other side there's so many layers and it's such a complex web of different people and different middlemen helping get product to the to the shelf to the consumer and so we had a lot to learn through that process there's a lot of behind the scenes i I bet if someone made an infographic out of that it would just be a crazy (laughs) web of love that infographic just for my own sake (laughs) it's like insanity um that's what it's called what did you learn about the supply chain that was helpful for you? Because you had to learn really quickly going from you know that store to 1,300 stores very quickly. Yeah, it was interesting. I think that Alex handled a lot of that, so mm-hmm. I give him so much credit. And he really was able, with supply chain being especially a small startup company, no one wants to give you the time of day. And it's really persistent, and you have to be able to – be willing and be determined to get people on the phone, get them to answer your questions and knowing that as with economies of scale, those prices are going to get better, but it takes time. Mm-hmm. And then building those relationships. It's amazing to look at some of these suppliers who've been part of Love Grown since the, since the beginning or so, for so long. And I think that you can start building those relationships early, mm. but it is, it takes persistence. And unless you're, you know, a Kellogg's or a General Mills and producing millions of pounds of product regularly, it's hard to get attention and to get them to even answer or return a phone call. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I want to go back to the early days, Maddie, because I find it very interesting. I mean, right now, obviously you're in, you're in a lot of major grocery and I, you know, I'm able to find videos, people making videos about your cereal that are getting like 30,000 views on YouTube and you have these fans that are advocates for you. But back in the early days, I want you to talk about a typical day. You know, you were working a full-time job and producing this and trying to get it into the local stores. What did life look like then? What were you, when you get back from work, what would have to happen? So or maybe Alex, you try and forget those days, but yeah, I think we do. I do think there's some um, some of like the amnesia effect of that, um, intentional intentionally. But we graduated a year early from college, so we were in our early 20s when we had this idea to start Love Grown. Yeah. We were working full time jobs. Alex was a teller at Wells Fargo. I was teaching Pilates, doing nutritional consulting and massage therapy. And in addition to that, we were also babysitting for two different families. So we had like so many different jobs. And Alex was the one who researched barcodes, packaging, nutritional labels, everything it takes to put a new product on the shelf. And we would go from all of these side jobs to either late at night or early in the morning, either finding time to bake batches or just stick our labels onto bags. So our initial granola bags were clear and we had a full size sticker that we would stick on the front and then stick on the back. And we would do it like in the morning, like while watching the Tour de France in the summer, it was like 5 a.m. We're just stickering bags. And then we would go off to our jobs. And then we started getting first initially it was coffee shops. And so we were selling into coffee shops and it was a manageable amount of product. But then was we it got hard to get into those. Was it just a matter of you going in and saying, hello, here's what we have? Or was it more difficult? They were relationships we had. So we we actually started the company in my hometown. I grew up in Aspen and it was it's where I was born and raised and it's a small town and so we had so much support of the community and the coffee shops one of which I had where it was a specialty food store that I used to work in and they were so quick to take the product Mm. and then one day Alex was working at Wells Fargo and the city market manager city market being a subsidiary of Kroger came up to him and was like or came up to Alex and one day Alex was like, I know this is years off, but my girlfriend and I own a health food company. We'd love to know what it takes to eventually get on your shelves. And John was like, bring it in, let me see. Mm. Two months later, we were on an end cap in City Market. We sold over 300 bags in the first three days, over a thousand bags the first month. To put in perspective, a great granola sells. Did you have to, did you have to sticker all those? Yeah, we had to sticker all of those. And I remember very clearly one time walking in 
walking around the corner of the grocery store and seeing the end cap empty, like only a few bags on it, and started bawling. And I called my mom and I was hysterical saying, the shelves are empty and we don't have any more product. And she's laughing. She was like, this is an amazing problem. The best problem, problem right? Hysterical because we didn't have time to make more and it was selling so well. So what do you do then? <laughs> you pull all-nighters. What does any entrepreneur do? You don't sleep. And you just play and you make it happen and the option for quitting or failure isn't it doesn't exist and you figure it out. So how long did it take you to fulfill that to restock it after it the was sold out? Like a couple days. Okay. Um, for that, but we have had when so we went from being in that one store up in Aspen to then getting the opportunity to be in 80 King Supers and City Markets within a it was like a we found out three or four months in this like in this time frame to ramp up production and we were in Denver we were by this time had a different commercial baking facility and the oven stopped working right before we got the oh, PO wow. from King Supers. We literally packed our cars full of all of our ingredients, all of our scales, all of our packaging. We drove back up to Aspen in two cars with loaded with everything we would need. And we pulled a 24, like almost, I think it was almost 27 hour shift. Wow. And like called in reinforcements. Like we had my mom, my brother, my dad, like it was over the holidays. We just had anyone and everyone come help make this first order. Like not fulfilling that first order for King Supers was not an option. And it was nuts it's amazing yeah there's there's so many moving pieces here so like i want to unpack it so you know with this like logistics we have the product side we have the distribution and getting into all these places and we have the production side take me right. through the evolution of the production so it goes from your kitchen to <laughs> what what after that so we went from our college house yeah in baking with roommates and bringing samples to friends and classmates and figuring out um, different recipes to then being in a commercial kitchen that was downstairs and didn't have an elevator. So when we were in Aspen, we were in this amazing commercial kitchen that someone had, um, in, they were, you know, friends within the valley who were like, yeah, you can bake with us. We would haul hundreds of pounds of ingredients. Yeah, it doesn't seem like a big deal, but when you're hauling huge, really heavy ingredients, that is a big difference. Yeah, 50 pound bags of oats like up and down stairs. We were buying ingredients at Costco initially, like, oh my gosh, it was nuts. And then we moved to Denver and we got another commercial baking facility. And the only time that we were allowed to be in there was between uh, four o'clock at night and four o'clock in the morning. Perfect. So we, yeah, perfect. It made that we had the entire day then to go be doing demos, races, and events, but it was ludicrous. So we would be there, we'd get there around four or five, and we had to manage making sure we had all the inventory, but then also we had all the bags because we were still hand stickering all of the bags. So typically while product was baking, then we would be stickering. Wow. And then we went from that commercial baking facility, we were in at the time about 100 or so King Super City Markets throughout Colorado. And we get this opportunity to present to Kroger Corporate. So we fly to Cincinnati, we land and we have to pay double to rent a car because we're under 25 and it's the biggest presentation of our lives and this dates me because there was no Uber. And we have to go present, we go present to Kroger and we present to go nationwide with them. We had advisors and some people in the industry saying like, this is great, you have a meeting with Kroger, don't get your hopes up, they don't pioneer companies, that's what Whole Foods does, this is 2010. Mm. We come back, two months later, Kroger says, we're taking four of your five SKUs of granola and we're launching you into 750 stores. Oh. So with that, we raised capital, we got our own commercial baking facility, and we start ramping up our production, and then two weeks before we got the purchase order, they call us and say, we're actually not launching you into 750 stores. We're launching you into 1,300. Why the change? <laughs> like totally crazy. I have no idea. Is there planograms and how they decide to do these these different um, sets? And so we went from one store to 1,300 stores in a year and a half in the second largest retailer behind Walmart. Wow. And that we had to pull more 24-hour shifts to ensure that we could fulfill that first PO. Um, and that was all in our own baking facility. And then about two years later, we outsourced our manufacturing. 
So the products at the time, now you have a number of products. What was at the time when you went to Kroger's? It was our original granolas. So the raisin almond crunch, the cranberry pecan, the cocoa goodness, and the apple walnut. Mm. And so then I want to continue on. So that, that kind of completes the, I had to find out the, you know, the production journey uh, a little bit. Um, you mentioned a couple things in passing that I want to circle back to. So at what point do you introduce the next products? So you go from granola. What was the next, what was the product evolution? The next you go from pro- pesto to <laughs> granola to what was next? Right, to oatmeal. So mm-hmm. the product evolution was really, and I give Alex so much credit. Alex is is the way his brain works and the way he thinks about these things is how do we leverage our economies of scale? How do we buy more ingredients that we're already buying so that we can drive down our prices? And the natural evolution of Love Grown was to buy more oats and go into oatmeal. So we launched, we actually waited though to launch another product for about three or four years. And a lot of that had to do with great advice from one of our advisors who said, focus. Before you start running in every different direction or chasing shiny objects, make sure that you build a solid foundation. And so we got distribution into about 7,000 stores before we launched our next product line. Mm. Wow. Um, And I think it helped lay a solid foundation so that when we did that new product, we had the distribution and we were able to leverage that distribution for that next product. Wow. Um, so the, the oats or the, uh, the hot cereal was that, hot yeah, yep. hot cereal was next. And then what was after that? So from hot oats, then we launched a super oats, hot cereal blend with oats, quinoa, amaranth and chia, which we just recently discontinued. Unfortunately, it was amazing, but, um, we're cleaning up all the portfolio, which is another thing we can, after we get through everything we can speak to. <laughs> the, the discontinuations and some of the heartache that comes, especially as a founder, because every product I love so much. Um, but we launched into the oatmeal and hot cereal segment, and it wasn't until about 2014 that we knew the evolution of the brand. We never wanted to be a granola company. Alex and I never called it Love Grown Granola ever because we knew we wanted to be more than that. We want to be a natural foods company. We have the vision and desire to really change the way people eat food and the access they have to healthy foods. And we started with breakfast, but the goal is to one day have Love Grown products in multiple aisles of the grocery store. And it made sense for us to then go into the box cereal category, which When you look at barriers to entry, granola barriers are so low. Everyone makes granola in their kitchen. They sell it at farmer's markets, and that's why you have so many local and regional granola players. When you look at box cereal, that manufacturing has to happen in a huge facility. These pieces of equipment are millions of dollars, and the minimum production runs are hundreds of thousands of pounds. Mm -hmm. And so we suddenly stopped going up against mom and pop granola and started going up against huge CPG companies. And so when we made this leap into box cereal, we knew we didn't want to just be a me too product. Instead, we wanted to really innovate in the cereal category, a category that's been so stale and stagnant for the last 20 years. And instead of making cereal out of wheat or corn, we're making it out of beans, navy, lentil, and garbanzo beans. How did you come to that? Tell me about the brainstorming session. <laughs> so, Alex, these are like these things that kind of randomly just pop into my head, but it was um, a little bit of inspiration from the chip aisle, actually. It was as Benito's was launching, and mm-hmm. it was this, this idea that you could eat chips that weren't made out of wheat or corn, but actually made out of beans. And looking at more nutrient dense foods. So, Love Grown, all of our products are certified gluten free. And one of my biggest complaints in this industry is for so long, gluten free was just empty calories like potato flour, white rice flour, tapioca starch, foods that are naturally gluten free but that have no nutritional value and aren't nutritionally dense. And so to make something like cereal more nutritionally dense and to take something like beans that are higher in protein, higher in fiber and lower in sugar and make them into cereal, the light bulb went off. And so we took the concept to a cereal manufacturer and worked really closely with their innovation team and with my expectations of this is like flavor and nutritional guidelines and things that we want in this product and we launched our power o's i believe it was march of 2014 and it was um a hit it totally i mean we coined the term beans for breakfast and people at 
at Expo West, it was like stopped in their tracks. They were mm. like, what? How it's did you awesome. come up with the flavors? Because you have the strawberry and the chocolate. <laughs> I would say um, not as methodically as we probably should have. And this is where hindsight, learning lessons of really utilizing data and seeing what are the most popular flavors as opposed to just a little bit of like what's on the shelves and what do we want. But we launched a uh, chocolate, strawberry, original, and honey. We ended up actually discontinuing the honey, but we have the, the three mm. flavors and um, I think it was really looking at you have, you know, your original Cheerios and you have Honey Nut Cheerios and then you have chocolate Cheerios. And the strawberry, it was actually one, a flavor that we tried with our co-packer manufacturer and we loved it. And we mm. said, you know, this also caters to kids and is great. And it wasn't until about two years later that we launched the kids cereal line of bean cereals. And those have been a total hit. So what do you have available for the kids on the kids line? The kids, we have four different flavors. We have a Fruity Sea Stars, which tastes like Fruit Loops. It's amazing. We have a Chocolate Comet Crispy, a Blueberry Vanilla Polar Puff, and then we also just launched a new Cinnamon Lion Loops. And this is where the data piece comes into play. We should have launched Cinnamon in the very beginning. It's the most popular kids flavor of cereal. And I think when we looked in hindsight, we were like, how have we not launched Cinnamon? We launched it earlier this year and it's already doing really well. Yeah, I think there is a there's a clip on Good Morning America where they're trying your cereals and the lady said uh, the sea stars taste like whatever right. Fruit Loops or like a health, obviously it's a healthy version of like a sugary cereal that I remember having at some point in our in our uh, cabinet that was not healthy at all. Yeah, exactly. Savannah Guthrie's like, oh my gosh, it tastes just like tricks, but I used to tricks, be as a kid. Right, and I'm exactly. like, dying. you should have seen when that clip, when we found out we were on the Today Show, we found out that morning. I mean, we had been in talks with them, but they never guarantee. And it was, I was, your, it was a full spread full, of Love Grown Products. I was running circles through our house, losing it. It was amazing. Like, it was so amazing. Does something like that, do you see a spike with that? Or. I've heard both sides where some, they're on it and it, you know, online stuff produced way more exposure. And I've had people who it, it's blown up uh, their, their sales. Yeah, I think we definitely saw a big spike in traffic to our website, things like that. We don't do as much e-commerce, so it was hard. It's not like it crashed our, our e-commerce. And it's hard to truly track what drives the lift in sales that occurred, whether it was like we were also running promotions. We have all these other things happening, so it's hard to say it was exactly because of the Today Show, but it's just such amazing. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it reaches four million people or something crazy. It's just an opportunity for people to hear for the first time, like, wow, there's a company making cereal out of beans. Right. Really? Like, that's huge. It sticks out, yeah. What about other, you mentioned you were, it's one point you'd be, you know, from 4 p.m. to 4 a.m. producing and then you'd be at different events. What's been effective or maybe not effective that you thought would be as far as the marketing pieces go? Like you're doing races and other because there's like almost in-store marketing and then there's stuff that you probably have to drive promotional things out of store. Totally. I think that the promotional marketing is so critical and one that you need to be so strategic about. And we learned that lesson the hard way. And I think that's where in hindsight, one of the earlier hires we should have made hands down with someone with experience in sales, like sales, like you get me in front of a buyer. I'm so excited and so passionate, but then it, there's so much that goes into really making sure you set up the, the product and the brand for success when it comes to promotional strategy, especially working with distributors. There's so many different ways you can promote on shelf and, May, we learn that now we know versus when we first started, we had no idea. So I think that that side of the marketing is so critical and really making sure that that's where most of your efforts are because those tags are up all day for two weeks or a month or whatever it is. So you're reaching everyone who's walking down that aisle. Whereas you can do demos and races and events, but you're only hitting a very small population for a very limited time and you don't, and it's a lot of effort and a lot of time and a lot of resources. And I think companies, especially startups, you have so limited resources figuring out how do you make the best use of your dollar 
And um, we did a lot of local events, which hands down helped, but I think it's not scalable. And that's where small companies struggle is that when we went from 100 stores to 1300 stores, there was no way we could take the events and the demos and duplicate it. So instead we bought a bus which was totally crazy. We branded it and I proceeded to drive it across the country for five months with my mom, which is so crazy. You just and your mom. Yeah, just me and my mom. Alex would come and meet us in certain cities and then fly back. He was running our operations, but we went to um, all over different Kroger banners and we were demoing in stores and trying to get our story out. And then we were, you know, doing races and mommy groups and all across the country. I was in, um, wow. I don't know how many states, but that was, and also in hindsight, I'm not sure if it was the best thing to do, but it was, we were like, we've been demoing and sampling our product in, in locally in Colorado. We have to do that now nationally. So we proceeded to drive across the country and demo like crazy. What was the best thing that came out of that five month journey? Oh my gosh, being with my mom. Like, how amazing is that? I think that... Um, That's the, the best trip. and the worst if you guys start killing each other by the end of the trip. She's amazing. I mean, she... The fact that she was willing to go with me and was such a trooper. That's an amazing experience, an amazing, really special time. But I also think realizing what we were doing with this company. Here we were driving all across the country, meeting total strangers and seeing people fall in love with our products, telling us how it's helping change their eating habits and getting them to eat healthier, how grateful they are to find gluten-free options, all these different things. And I think it's that realization that we are changing lives and we have an opportunity to really impact, have a big impact. And that's so motivational mm -hmm. as well as, I mean, that's such a rewarding part of building this company. Maddie, from a customer standpoint, have any customer profiles surprised you? Like you didn't think of the whatever uh, Crohn's people or someone's gluten free, or were you thinking of that while you were creating the, you know, the, the cereal that doesn't have, you know, gluten free? Any yeah. specific customer profiles surprise you that have picked up and really just become advocates? I think that there are more surprises than you would would imagine and people of all different shapes, sizes, backgrounds want, seeking natural foods, which is why it's such an exciting time to be in this industry because there is so much growing demand for natural foods. I think more than anything, what touches me the most and which I we knew and we intended, especially because my mom was a special education teacher and there's so much inspiration behind growing up and seeing what she did in Love Grown, but we would get these heartfelt emails from parents saying, you have no idea how much your cereal has changed our lives. My hmm. kid is allergic to wheat, soy, corn, dairy, and Red 40, Blue 10, all these different things, and to find a cereal that makes them feel normal is life-changing. Hmm. And I think things like that, that I didn't expect, we, we were adamant on avoiding corn and wheat and um, red, of, of course, all the artificial colors and dyes. But then to see those impacts is is totally amazing. What about so go back to the discontinued products, right? So there's great sellers: the the cinnamon, the strawberry, the chocolate. Um, I would have guessed honey would be a good seller. Um, yeah. How do you decide to then discontinue it, or maybe it could be oh we just didn't market it enough, as opposed to maybe it's not hitting like the other ones. These are such tough decisions to make, especially as a founder of a company, because like I said, they're all like my kids. I love them all. But we really had to look hard at all of our products and look at our margins. So first and foremost, that's the biggest driver. When you look at honey, the expense of it and the margin or lack thereof um, is a huge decision factor. Then you have to look at the sales and the volume. And if you're not cutting the minimum requirements for production or you're not seeing the turns that you need to in your retailer, I mean, that's being, you have to be proactive with your SKUs. And I think that factoring in also, what is it in the competition? When you look at honey, everyone has a honey O. Literally any, all mm. natural brands as well as all conventional brands. And so to be incremental, especially when we are offering something so unique and different, um, how do we, 
how do we find this balance of not having flavors that are so obscure that they're two different, but at the same time aren't competing with the other yeah. 10 cereal brands on the shelf? It's a tough balance. Totally a tough balance. And I don't think there's a perfect recipe for success, but it's a bit of trial and error and making sure that you're being proactive and watching and um, not as much reactive. Okay. Yeah. So if anyone has the Honey O's, it's a limited edition and they could probably sell it on eBay for a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, you mentioned something just in passing, which is really interesting, you know, about your journey with the one store going to 1,300 stores. And you just mentioned passing, yeah, we had to raise capital. That, you know, those two words is, is another full time job. So what was that journey like? for you in the midst of growing so quickly. Right, yeah. I think that's the other huge piece of the natural foods industry or really the CPG world, but especially in, in the food industry that startup companies don't think about or don't realize how capital intensive this industry is. And once again, I, I talk about an end consumer is like, great, Kroger is amazing. Like my product's on sale or like Sprouts is amazing. It's on sale. And they assume it's Sprouts who's giving you that discount where the discount's coming from the actual manufacturer. And they're the mm -hmm. one who's literally taking that money out of their pocket and letting the consumer have that savings. Sprouts and those retailers, often they may share a little bit, but they're, they're not taking that hit. It's really the manufacturer. And I think when you look at how slim margins are in the food business and how competitive it is, it is so hard to grow a sustainable business without an injection of capital. So when we went from one store to 1,300 stores, we had to raise capital just to buy enough raw materials to meet that order. Oh. Let to continue to support the product once they got on the shelves. And we were so lucky and so fortunate to have met our, our first partner and who's still our, our um, primary partner, who was an angel investor and we got the opportunity to connect with him, loved the story. He was kind of following along as we were going to that initial presentation with Kroger and mm. knew, you know, if you get like 400 stores, that would be amazing. So when we came back with 750, that turned into 1,300, he was like, there's something here, like I'm in. And so you were kind of prepping a little bit before the meeting to like have your ducks in a row, like, okay, we get this, we're gonna need these, you know, this capital in place to really make it happen. We knew that we would not be able to pull the trigger if we didn't have that capital. And um, I think that, like you said, it's a full time job. And you have to raise capital and make sure you find great partners because it can make or break your business. And we have been so incredibly fortunate to have really incredible partners who really believe in what we're doing and believe in the products. And I think that that's such, it's such a huge piece of, of this. I mean, you look at companies raising hundreds, of, I mean, 10 millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars. It's a really, capital intensive industry to, in order to be successful at. So I noticed another thing that you have a board of advisors. I'm curious at what point did you put together a board of advisors and the importance of put, doing that? We put the board of advisors together early on when we started raising that capital and had just gotten mm -hmm. into the 1300 Kroger stores. And I think that was certainly one of the best things we did, especially because so much of starting a business and running a business is being in the day-to-day -day minutia, which is, it drowns you. It just, you, it's hard to get your head above water. And to have, to be forced to have board meetings on a quarterly basis where you pull yourself back and look at the business from a 10,000 foot level and really assess what are we doing? What did we seek out to accomplish? What are we going to accomplish? Where do we stand? It's just so critical to pull yourself out of that day-to-day -day craziness and we had, were really fortunate we brought on some really incredible people in this industry Mo Siegel who founded Celestial Seasonings Tea Tom Spear who was one of the original uh, founder or not founders but original team members at Bare Naked um, came on board and they were so great to be able to sit down with and be able to bounce ideas off of and um, really hear from and learn from early on was incredible yeah I mean talking about all the moving pieces, man, I get stressed out just thinking about all this. And, and something we haven't talked about too is um, the team and hiring, 
right? Yeah. And because all this is happening because you've able you've been able to grow a great team. What were some of the key hires and you mentioned before? Like maybe I wish I would have had someone specializing sales or promotions or whatever. What were yeah. some of the key hires along the the way? Hands down, sales is one of the most important ones, and finding people who have ex more experience than you do and being willing and able to recognize that and seeing it as a straight as a, a positive and not a negative i think that that was some of the best things and we've had we now have some some team members who've been with us for so for such a period of time and have been through so much with us i just think that there's that's so important because they know the story. They are going to be your feet on the ground. I can only be in so many cities <laughs> at once. <laughs> and yeah. um, you have to be able to be able to spread that out and get into there's so many buyers to see. So sales is super important as well as operations and having the ability and the supply chain. We brought on a VP of operations um, probably three or four years ago who really changed the business and was able to also set a different tone and provide beyond just the operational side, but um, almost leadership within the company. I'm on the road so much. I literally am out of the office more than I'm in the office because we're I'm spreading the love. I'm at meetings with buyers and to have someone who can really be that constant um, is so key and who can be you know everything from the hr side to all the other things that go array awry on you yeah know, things. how has your role changed so obviously you started cook you basically were doing everything and stickering it packaging now what does your role look like now you mentioned you're on a road a lot I'm much more focused on sales and supporting our marketing team, um, but really it has allowed me to reduce my focus to what I'm best at, which is being in front of our customers and our consumers and spreading the love to them. And it's such a relief. I think that it took 10 years <laughs> to get here and it took, it was 10 years of, like you said, wearing every single hat, doing everything and um, trying to juggle so many balls in the air and to be able to pass the, that baton, if you will, and get really talented, amazing people on our team so that I can let them take that over and actually do a better job at it so that I can focus on supporting our sales and marketing. I mean, that's it's huge. It's amazing. The You also have ancient grains. Yes. Tell me about those. So these are brand new and I am super excited about them. We just launched a new line of ancient grain premium granolas made with avocado and coconut oil. Mm. It's the first granola made with avocado oil and it's the one of the only granolas on the shelf that has three grams of sugar. So it's very low in sugar. It's about half the sugar as most granolas on the shelves. And this product is so buttery. It's so delicious, really large clusters, and it's made with oats, quinoa, puffed amaranth, chia seeds, and then um, sweetened with a hint of, really lightly sweetened with brown um, brown rice syrup and molasses. And then we're also using pink Himalayan salt mm. to give it this slightly salty, like addictingly good flavor. Um, and they come in three different flavors and it's one of the only granola lines that has no added fruit. So it's more of a savory snackable granola. We have almond sesame, coconut lime and a pumpkin cashew and it's just totally delicious um and super i'm super excited about it so how does that work with you know so you have you're across thousands of stores will they when you come out with this new product how will they allow you to introduce that yeah so we started presenting it already and kroger was the first to take it nationally and it just hit shelves in about 1300 or around there uh, 1300 stores nationwide a month ago it's so progress for Sicaria, but we have a number of other retailers who seem very excited about it and we'll be getting more distribution here on it as well so be be on the lookout i have to try this you know yes. using the word buttery with it makes me want to eat it actually right. um what do you think it was about the presentation with kroger like you know everyone was telling you you know don't expect much they may get back to you in a couple of years did they get any, give you any feedback of, I mean, obviously the product is great and the company, but obviously you're presenting it in a certain fashion that makes it, you know, desirable. Did they give you feedback on why it works so well with what you did? They 
We never got direct feedback, but I think it's twofold. First and foremost, we were in the right place at the right time. And when you look at what Kroger has done in natural foods, it's incredible. They, I mean, this was 10 years ago when they were really saying, we're going to make an investment in natural foods and we are going to focus on it. And they did it before any of the other large retailers really did. I mean, of course there's Whole Foods, but Kroger made it a point to build and grow natural foods. And we just happened to be in that same launch phase. And then the other part of it is I think, um, hands down, having that passion and energy and enthusiasm about what we're doing and what our, why we believe so much in our products and what um, we were introducing to the market. So I think that there's certainly a bit of that that went into it, but um, we had such strong sales going into that meeting because of the success we had had in King Supers locally in Colorado. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't like it, um, it wasn't, you know, it, there was a reason for them to really look hard at the brand and the products. Many, I'm interested, I'm curious about your uh, views on e commerce versus retail because you've gone. I, th- I don't know, hundred. it's not 100% retail. Do you, can people buy it online anywhere? Yep, so they can buy it on Amazon, Vitacost, Lucky Vitamin, mm-hmm. um, and there's another one I'm probably forgetting. And I think that e-commerce is such, such an amazing tool and it's certainly a direction that so many consumers are going to be going, especially with shelf-stable products. And um, Amazon, you know, it's, it's critical. Am- who doesn't buy anything on Amazon? Right. If you can introduce me to one person, I mean, it's amazing. Everyone uses Amazon to some capacity and I think that being having that ability for people to try a product and purchase it without having to search it out in a store, especially with the direction it's going with social media and the power of influencers, people hear about these things and they want to try it right then and there and they want to be able to buy it. And so being able to have those options, I mean, Vitacost is an amazing resource for all things natural and specialty. It's my one of my favorite platforms to find everything from supplements to beauty products to natural foods. Um, and I think that it's certainly going to only become, e-commerce is only going to grow. Um, so Love Grown. How hard was it to get that domain? This is an amazing story. So my only request to Alex, when we were undergrads at DU, we were studying for finals in the library and we like decided to kind of push that aside and start talking about our business plan. Was like, my own- finals, let's talk about it. <laughs> so much more request- exciting. Yeah, way more exciting. My only request to him was that love had to be in the name. And Alex is so pragmatic and so such a visionary and was like, okay, we can use love, but it can't have hearts and it has to be, you know, general neutral, gender neutral. We need to make it appeal to the masses. So we came up with a list of 30 different names. And when we said love grown, it just stuck. And at that time, this is back in 2008, Alex reached out to who at the time owned lovegrown.com. Yeah, it doesn't seem like it'd be an easy domain to get because it's two words that are easy to spell that, right. yeah. And I think it might've been like, I don't know, $500 at the time to buy, which huh. we didn't have. We were like, we can't afford that. So we talked to the guy, didn't end up buying it. And then I think it was seven years later, we <laughs> reached back out to him. It was the same guy. And then it was like $5,000 or something crazy. I have no idea. Um, but we ended up obviously buying the domain and making that transition. But it's just amazing that it, it, we, it was very beginning that we reached out and it took us seven years to actually be able to, to buy it. And the price increase was dramatic. By 10 times. Yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah thanks for sharing that. Um, I always ask this inspired insight. First of all, thank you, Maddie. This is this is great. I love hearing more about Love Grown, and I'm sure uh, everyone listening has got a lot out of this. Um, I always like to ask two questions. One, um, since it's Inspired Insider, what's been a low moment? And on the flip side, what's been a proud moment? Because as you know, like the journey over 10 plus years is, it has some, you know, it's like a roller coaster sometimes. So what's been a low moment and what's been a high point for you? My gosh, there are certainly so many, both lows and highs. And um, I think about one in the distant past, which we clearly overcame, but um, when our ovens weren't working and having to pack Pack all our cars and go produce, I remember um, I totally started crying 
to Alex and was like, maybe we should just not do this. <laughs> like, totally being extreme. And one of the things, Alex is amazing because we're such opposites. And he is so calm and collected. And I'm totally collected, but not calm. And um, he makes decisions. He's like very even keel. <laughs> and so he was like, it's okay. We will be fine. Like, get it together. And I'm really questioning, like, why are we doing this? Why are we starting this company? And um, thank goodness for him. He totally helped me through like pull it together we're going to make this happen but I think that there's so many ups and downs and um especially I mean I can name so many little ones of like you lose distribution in a customer or you you know find out that you're going to your pricing increase but from your supplier and your heart sinks just knowing like you're already working off tight margins and then to have an ingredient cost increase and not be able to pass that on to your retailers and it's just those things that happen almost hourly that you're having to overcome and manage through and reset. Not for the faint of heart. Yeah, exactly. Certainly not for the faint of heart. Um, on the flip side though, you do have so many amazing moments. And I think that hopefully those amazing moments overpower the negative ones. And that's, I think why you keep going slash. I also think that entrepreneurs are like overly optimistic in life and that's another reason that they're crazy enough to keep going is that you just think like yes this will it will be will totally it will work um but i think the consumer side and seeing the impact we're making on people's lives and getting these messages or meeting people in person that change that totally changed my perspective on what we're doing and the reach of what we're doing to um, being on the Today Show, hands down, like totally amazing. Um, to also being with our team, and I think building a team and realizing, like, I'm not doing this alone. Hands down, we have an amazing group of talented, hardworking, amazing individuals that I'm so grateful for and who work really hard and who have been a huge part of building this brand and who are a huge reason that Love Grown is available in 11,500 stores that it is. Yeah. I mean, at one point you were even approached to be acquired, right? That was a crazy experience. Talk about emotional roller coaster. Yeah, that was totally crazy. Came out of the blue. We weren't, we weren't selling the company. It um, came to us and ended up after a pretty long discussion with them, decided not to go that direction. But that came with so many ups and downs and emotional roller coaster times 10. It was crazy. And an amazing experience, I think, hands down, probably one of the best life experiences, just because there's so much that goes into getting a deal done and figuring out all the nuances be behind that. Um, really, really fascinating and amazing. What came out of that that was positive that made you, made it stronger on the, on the other side after going through that process? Because I imagine that process is pretty intense. Super intense. I think more than anything, realizing we have something really special. And the fact that someone wanted to buy the company says a lot. And it just confirms that what we're doing, we're a bit ahead of our times of even taking beans. You're starting to see beans in so many things. So it's not like beans are totally crazy and they're nothing abstract. Like when quinoa was first introduced, it was so, you know, people didn't even pronounce, know how to pronounce it. Whereas beans, people have been eating forever. But beans in a sweet type of option, not a savory option. And in something like cereal, we're still early in this. And I think that it just confirms that what we're, we're on the right path of plant-based, high protein, looking for opportunities to innovate in categories where you have everyday foods that are lacking nutritional density. And more than anything, that's what came out of that experience of like, we have something, let's make sure we build it because it's, continue to build it and not sell ourselves short. Totally. Maddie, I want to be the first one to thank you so much. Um, everyone should check out lovegrown.com and check it out at any of the grocery stores near you. Thanks, Maddie. Yes, thank you. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire. Came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand